Long before I became perhaps the first permaculture urbanist, I owned a tiny software company. My apps used a grade school math trick to achieve insanely high performance on incredibly dumb handheld devices. In today's episode, I'll share how cities can use this same trick to become richer, more vibrant places for every resident while saving the world. Welcome to Edenicity, best practices for sustainably abundant cities. The problem, and I can't say this enough, is that we have occupied half the land on Earth and wiped out half the life on Earth. Meanwhile, cities occupy just 2.8% of the land, and since 2007, more than half of us have lived in cities. That number is growing by 200,000 people a day. Now here's the exciting concept behind Edenicity. If we could meet all of our daily needs within cities, we just might have a chance at restoring wild habitat to bring Earth fully back to life. But is this possible? Could we really shrink our housing, energy, transportation, and food systems by a factor of 20? Could we do this while making cities feel less crowded. Spoiler alert, yes, we can do all that and more. How? Environmentalists have for about a century been on the right track with the concept that we should share more rather than all having to hog so many resources. What Edenicity adds is that we need to do this at scale in cities using large-scale systems. That's where that grade school math trick comes in. It's called factoring. You remember factoring, right? The steps are pretty simple. Look for patterns, group repeated elements, and hey, suddenly it's easier. So here's an example. You go to a store to buy batteries, and for some reason you buy six four-packs and three six-packs of batteries. How many batteries do you have? Now the slow way using two multiplications is just six times four plus three times six is 24 plus 18. That's the part that always slows me down, double digits, 42. But with factoring, there's a slightly faster way. Notice that the six is repeated on the left-hand side of that expression. That lets us group the four and the three, which then become seven times six is 42. Just one multiplication and so much quicker to compute. This is a little bit like a rugged rafting trip we're taking together. The next slide is going to be going through the rapids. I promise you the rest of this presentation won't be nearly as hairy. Ready? Here we go. Here's how factoring works in software and in life. In software, multiplications and exponentials are very expensive. At least they were 20 years ago on devices that didn't have GPUs or math coprocessors. So you wanted at all costs to avoid multiplications. So this slide has three examples that have raw expressions with lots of multiplications and then the factored version that is the exact same thing but with fewer multiplications. So in the first expression, we have five multiplications, a times y plus b times y, and so on, up to e. And then by factoring, we can just pull a through e out, add them separately, and then just do one multiplication by y to speed that calculation up by a factor of nearly five. In the next example, we factor a polynomial and speed it up by a factor of nearly eight. Final example, we're summing a series of constants multiplied by y for 100 values of y, and we can just take those constants a through c, add them up, and multiply them by the sum series of y to speed that up by a factor of 300. These are just a few of the many mathematical optimizations that you can have with software. And if you're familiar with software, you're probably thinking, well, wait a minute, the compiler should be able to do that. The computer should do a lot of this optimizing for you. And indeed, people were telling me this back in the 90s, but when I tested the software, I found that the optimizations were pretty weak. Even as recently as last week, I found that artificial intelligence did not naturally factor its software when I was coding for the Edenicity map for the Edenicity membership. See the link in the description, like and subscribe while you're at it. Okay, let's see how these optimizations actually worked in real software. The software was called TwoSky and it ran on the Palm Pilot, which actually first launched at about a quarter megabyte of memory and incredibly slow clock speed. I forget what it was. No graphic processing unit, no math coprocessors. Compare that to an iPhone, which has 64 gigabytes minimum storage, plus a graphic processing unit. So we're talking about a factor of 64,000 in storage and probably a similar factor, if not more, in speed, because that graphic processor makes multiplication super easy and it does them thousands at a time. So quite literally, 
the Palm Pilot was somewhere between 64,000 and maybe up to a half a million times dumber than even the dumber smartphones today. My software had a number of loops that would do different things. One loop calculated where you were looking in the sky. Another one figured out where the sun, moon, planets, comets, and asteroids were. And by far the biggest loop pulled stars out of a massive database and drew them. Now, in order to animate all of this, it had to be fast. I optimized every loop, and if one loop was nested inside of another, then those optimizations would multiply all together. For example, if each of these loops were inside the other, and the optimizations sped things up by a factor of 8, 2, and 20, respectively, then the combination would get you a speed up of 320 times faster. And that is actually a little bit less than what I managed to achieve with it. I took these off-the-shelf equations and off-the-shelf methods that everybody used. If you're not a coder, you might be thinking, now come on, how can the math that you find in academic papers be so slow, be so unoptimized? But it just basically is. It's, it turns out just the easy way to express most things mathematically is not necessarily optimized for a computer. So that was fast enough. 320, 400 times faster. Made the operations really fast. But I also had to create this monster database. I put a million stars in this tiny device. And creating that million star database was a challenge. I had to take existing public domain databases and completely rearrange them by brightness and where they were in the sky and a few other things. And doing a sort of that size, using even pretty efficient off-the-shelf algorithms, was really, really slow. When I first coded it up, I had a little counter on it, and within a couple minutes I saw that it was going to take about seven months to complete. So I had to rethink it, refactor everything, and eventually came up with a version that created the database in 37 seconds. So all bragging aside, you're probably wondering, what has this got to do with cities? Cities are not software. There's no way to improve the performance of cities by a large amount. Software and cities are two completely different things, or are they? In my view, anything you can count, you can optimize mathematically. For example, in previous episodes, we have looked at four-way intersections versus roundabouts. Today, we'll get into detail about how factoring makes roundabouts so much higher performing. Let's start by zooming in on that four-way intersection. I'll come back to the slide in a moment. So this four-way intersection has traffic that can go in three directions from right, left, top, or bottom. And so that's 12 directions altogether. I'm not going to make you wait through all of the light cycles, but the important thing to notice is that the laws of physics don't protect you from side impact collisions. And if somebody comes zooming along the street from the left or right, you have the risk of a very high speed side impact collision. And it's not going to show it here, but when the cars finally do turn right and left across oncoming traffic, a signaled intersection has to shut down the pedestrians in all four crosswalks for everybody to be safe. It has to shut down eight out of the 12 possible directions directions that traffic could be moving. Now in this slide, we're looking at a roundabout. Unlike the signaled intersection, this is a lot simpler. You just basically yield to the pedestrians, pull forward, then yield to the cars that are already in the roundabout. This allows turns in all directions to be operating simultaneously. So it's a lot faster. And because everyone has to turn rather than crossing straight through the middle of the intersection, if there are collisions, they tend to be at a very low relative speed and in directions that are not as injurious as a side impact collision. So to summarize, a signaled intersection is a high risk, high cognitive load intersection because of the risk of high speed side impacts and the fact that you have to watch for pedestrians, then cars moving in three directions. Signal left turns stop all pedestrians, as well as eight out of 12 of the directions that the cars are turning. The roundabout, on the other hand, is low risk, low cognitive load, lower speeds, all turns are always active, and you just simply yield to cars that are already in the roundabout. So you're only looking in one direction rather than three when you're driving through the intersection. This allows roundabouts to be 89% faster and 90% safer than signaled intersections. I put the sources and some additional calculations in the description. So by Counting the directions that people are looking and just arranging the geometry a little bit differently, we can dramatically improve the performance of intersections in cities. But we can take this concept much farther. Design fails when elements merely multiply or divide in cities. I was driving through Columbus shortly after moving to the city in 2018. They were adding extra lanes to the 270 loop around the city. I said, hey, this is ridiculous. This is a failure to design. Building more lanes just compounds an already bad problem of traffic. Being stuck in traffic in five lanes 
is just as frustrating and a little bit more stressful and dangerous than being stuck in three or four lanes. Along the same lines, when the current design seems to be failing in the other direction, for example, if bus ridership goes down, simply downgrading the service can send a system like that into an economic death spiral where because there's less service, fewer people ride it, and because fewer people ride it, they keep downgrading the service. So in both of these cases, the basic design needs to be re-examined. One of my favorite books on large-scale systems design, Systems Architecting, by Eberhard Rechten, opens with the phrase, aggregation is the first function of architecture. And this again, mathematically, is a factoring process. How do we bring together elements that are needlessly repeated? When we look for ways to do this in cities, that's when urban design has a chance to succeed. It succeeds, among other things, when we can factor out grossly redundant infrastructure. As I illustrate in the videos linked at the end of this video, we can do this by converting car lanes and car parking into public transit facilities, and also zoning for multifamily housing rather than detached housing. In both cases, this can provide the same or higher levels of service on 20 to 30 times less land. Now, Edenicity is permaculture urbanism, so we take our cues from ecology. One of the key ideas in ecology is to stack functions. This is something that natural ecosystems automatically do. Rivers provide habitat, they move water and nutrients. Trees buffer floods and droughts, provide habitat, provide their own mulch and fertilizer, working with other species. Everything in an ecosystem has multiple functions and provides multiple services to other members of that ecosystem. In the case of Edenicity, we look for opportunities to get double and triple and quadruple duty out of every structure. Some examples of this include greenhouse roofs, block orchards, farm belts, food forests, solar sheltered bike paths, food forests that buffer floods and droughts. Yes, I'm excited about food forests. And in addition to that, we strive to make sure that our critical needs are met through multiple means, especially in terms of food crops. We don't want to be getting all of our calories from one or two or three crops. It's better if it comes from several dozen or more different crops, so that if one fails, we're doing fine, and that surpluses have other uses in the ecology as well. Can you see how stacking functions is akin to the factoring processes that we looked at earlier? And that meeting critical needs in multiple ways is akin to expanding equations, which would be the reverse of factoring. So by intelligent use of quantitative reasoning, in conjunction with ecological insights and biomimicry, cities can become greener, safer, quieter, healthier, higher quality, more convenient places to live, and, as a result, feel less crowded. Here are those episodes that I promised, and thank you so much to our new members on Patreon for helping to make Edenicity possible. Take care, stay green, see you next time.